Welcome graduates, family, friends, alumni, faculty, and staff to the 2021 Class Day Exercises. My name is Samira Miller and it is my greatest honor to serve as the first marshal of the Class of 2021. Today we celebrate our journey to and through Harvard as well as everyone who has been a part of it. We started our journey in the Tercentenary Theater of Harvard Yard, surrounded by each other's eager smiles, anxious laughs, and big dreams. With our dorm room keys swinging from our necks, we began to find our communities, our academic passions, and ourselves. For some of us, it was our first time witnessing the seasons change. And by some of us, I do also mean myself. <laughs> but besides the seasons, we also witnessed other change, one of my least favorites being Harvard time. I and a lot of you all were very upset that classes and meetings no longer started seven minutes after their set time. But little did we know that losing those seven minutes would be nothing compared to the minutes, months, and moments we would lose due to the COVID-19 pandemic. When we left campus in March of 2020, we said, see you later, not knowing that it could also be goodbye. We left wondering how we would possibly finish our classes, keep our student organizations intact, and also get ourselves, our families, and our communities through this pandemic. Thanks to our own family and friends, as well as the work of various Harvard faculty and staff, we did it. And no matter where you are in the world right now, no matter who you're with, you did it. And though for now we have to celebrate this accomplishment virtually, you best to believe that we will celebrate together in person next year as promised. And so class of 2021, I'd like to thank you for four years of meaningful memories. I'd also like to thank the class of 2021 committee for their tireless work to find special ways to celebrate our class this year. I'd also like to thank the Harvard Alumni Association and the Harvard College Fund, especially our advisors, John Prince and Gabriel Heft for their unwavering support. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of the family and friends who have driven us through our journey thus far. Class of 2021, just like this past year, we are truly unforgettable. Our path through Harvard was a unique one filled with many changes, challenges, and Zoom squares. But we have left our mark on Harvard, and I have no doubt that we will leave our mark wherever we go next. And now, I have the pleasure of introducing a defining figure in our class's transformative journey through Harvard. Please give a warm welcome to the Danoff Dean of Harvard College, Marvin Bauer Professor of Leadership Development at Harvard Business School and Professor of Sociology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Dean Rakesh Kurana. Hello, family, friends, and members of the class of 2021. I am so proud of you and so grateful to the people who have supported and encouraged you these past four years. I hope that class day has sparked happy memories of your time on campus, pursuing your studies and developing friendships in the yard and the houses. College is hard, even in the best of circumstances, but graduating during a pandemic is an extraordinary undertaking. When you left campus last spring, we had no idea what was in store for each of you for Harvard and for our world. You accepted uncertainty, changed your plans, reconfigured your thesis topics, adjusted your research plans, adapted to online courses, and reimagined live performances at virtual events. In some cases, you focused on training for your craft, sports, debate, music, rather than competing or performing. You had to find different ways of connecting with each other to overcoming difficulties beyond Harvard Square and to meeting the challenges of our national and global reckoning with racial and social justice. One of the ways that I found to handle this year's challenges was to get outside and walk as much as possible. On weekends, my wife Steffi and I take long walks, rain or shine, even in snow and cold weather. We explored new places and returned to our old favorite locations, which during the pandemic allowed us to reconsider our point of arrival in life. One of our favorite spaces to walk is at the beach. I love the natural beauty of beaches, the sound of the ocean, the smell of salt water, the feel of the sand and rocks beneath my feet, and vistas often too wide to see from any single angle. The beach can be a metaphor for our ever-changing lives, 
Sometimes it's quiet and calm. The air is still, the tide nothing more than a small ripple in the water. Sometimes there's a light tailwind at your back, propelling you gently forward. Other days, the same stretch of beach can be intense, even frightening, with strong winds and crashing waves that are a reminder of nature's raw power. On those days, I find that I'm most impacted by the headwinds. When you're walking against the wind, everything takes more effort. Headwinds push against you, making it hard to move forward. You can't ignore them. They get sand in your eyes and whistle past your ears, making it hard for you to see or hear what's around you. Walking into headwinds is exhausting. This past year, we've all faced more headwinds than we could have anticipated. To complete your senior year, you walked straight into those headwinds. Everything became more challenging. Life may have seemed like it was pushing against you at every turn, but through it all, you kept moving forward with grace and determination. You used the ways of thinking that Harvard most values, evidence, reason, veritas, to make your decisions about moving forward, even when the world around you seemed to be going the other way. You continued to research, learn, and play even in this changing landscape. You embraced public health guidelines. You rose up to fight injustice. You exercised leadership during an unprecedented election year. You worked to reimagine the way systems can work, and you stepped forward to challenge even those systems that have benefited you, but leave so many behind. In addition to Harvard's regular curriculum, this year you've undertaken a course in adapting to change. Meeting this moment has required more than flexibility. It has required courage, and it has required patience. In this past year, you may have been slowed, but you didn't stop. You may have bent, but you didn't break. You pivoted, you tacked, you reimagined, you never gave up. You, class of 2021, have inspired all of us this past year, in addition to all you'd already done in the days since we admitted you. For all the joy and gratitude we feel today, we cannot ignore the reality that many people around the world are still waiting to be vaccinated and continue to battle the pandemic. The good news is that there appears, at least for now in the United States, to be a break ahead of us from those unrelenting headwinds. In the months ahead, life may return to a new sense of normalcy. And as it does, I wish you only tailwinds, pushing you forward, making life a little bit easier. I hope that your most challenging days are behind you and that the wind will always be at your back. Realistically, though, I know that you will face new and different challenges in the years ahead. I do not believe that every challenge we face only makes us stronger. But I do believe that the trying times reveal strengths within each of us that we may not have known we had, strengths that we can draw upon when new challenges arise. After watching you this year, I have seen these strengths on display every day and believe that you are well prepared to face the uncertain world that awaits us. As Dean of the College, it is my greatest privilege to pronounce that members of the senior class are, quote, ready to advance knowledge, to promote understanding, and to serve society, end quote. That statement may be truer for all of you than for any previous Harvard class I have seen. Although we can't be together in person this year to celebrate, I am so honored to have the chance to congratulate you on fulfilling the mission of Harvard College and to pronounce you ready to go forth and become the citizens and citizen leaders our society so desperately needs. And while I am sorry that things have been so challenging, I am so grateful for the way you have continued to engage to keep this institution moving forward. When you look back at your time at Harvard, despite the challenges of this past year, I hope you will think fondly of your moments in the yard, the walks in the quad, or along the Charles in the late nights in Lamont. I hope you will come to view this time as a galvanizing force, one that exposed truths about not only the fragility of our society, but about our collective interdependence and your own resilience. And I hope that you will look back at this last year of your education as a catalyst for what is to come. The pandemic brought into starker focus for all of us, the systemic problems in our society, in social justice, in education, in healthcare, among others. I was recently reminded that it was only 150 years ago last year that Richard Theodore Greener, the first African-American to graduate from Harvard College, attended his own class day exercises. 
The Harvard he experienced and the world he graduated into were different from our Harvard, but change has not come fast enough, and the inequalities he faced persist. In an autobiographical sketch that year, Greener wrote that his long-term goals were, quote, to get all the knowledge I can, make all the reputation I can, and do good, end quote. We must continue to work toward creating a more inclusive Harvard, one that allows each student to get all the knowledge they can and to achieve their highest potential. I know that our aspirations continue to run ahead of our reality. As you look ahead, I hope you will think deeply about the role you can play in creating a different future for all of us. Your education, as challenging as it has been to acquire, will undoubtedly be a tailwind for you in the coming years. And while I wish for you tailwinds in all that you undertake, I hope that you will use your gifts and talents to find ways to lighten the burden of others who might be caught in the headwinds of life while being mindful that many headwinds are not visible to us. I also hope you will be humble because it is too easy to forget the tailwinds carrying us along. Take time now to feel the tailwind and its promise of hope. I am so proud of you and all that you have done and will do. I look forward to welcoming you back to campus soon to celebrate with you. Congratulations, class of 2021. Thank you, Dean Karana. My name is Devin Srivastava, and I serve as the secretary for the class of 2021. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker, Vanessa Liu, AB 96, JD 2003. Vanessa is the incoming president of the Harvard Alumni Association, a university-wide and global alumni network. As you will hear from Vanessa shortly, since graduating magna cum laude in psychology from the college and later cum laude from the law school, she surprisingly but happily found a new Harvard home within the alumni community. Vanessa is the vice president of SAP IO, a global organization responsible for building an ecosystem of startups around SAP. In her role, she is overseeing SAP IO's North American foundries in New York and San Francisco, including programs devoted to women and diverse-led business-to-business enterprise tech companies. Vanessa's commitment to her fellow alumni and our vast alumni community is evident in so many ways. She interviews prospective students, serves on her class reunion and gift committees, and as an active member on the HAA Board of Directors, she has served in a number of leadership roles, culminating in her most recent appointment as the new president of the HAA in the coming weeks. The class of 1996, as the class 25 years removed from us, is our parent class, and I recently had the pleasure of meeting Vanessa at an event with our two classes. Please join me in welcoming Vanessa Liu. Thank you, Devin. Hello, class of 2021. I'm so excited to be celebrating class day with you and your families. As the incoming president of the Harvard Alumni Association, welcome to the Harvard alumni community. It's been 25 years since I had my class day. When I was in your shoes, I must confess that I didn't yet appreciate what it meant to join this lifelong intergenerational and global community of over 400,000 alumni. It was an abstract concept to me, aside from joining the ranks of 400,000 others who also have trouble navigating the tricky question of what to say when asked, where did you go for college? On a side note, will you answer A in Boston, B in the Northeast, or for you all a new C on Zoom? But in all seriousness, I assumed that the chapter of connecting meaningfully with other people at Harvard was behind me. I was enthralled by the prospect of going out into the world literally upon graduation. My next stop was the Netherlands for a Fulbright, but I considered it a journey to take on my own. I had entered college with the ambition of becoming an astronaut, but was leaving with a different compass inspired by my time at the Institute of Politics. I had had a fulfilling time, but I was not one of those who could say I had the best time at Harvard. I was battle weary having pulled one too many all-nighters and had been overly concerned about my grades. It had not been a warm and fuzzy place, and we could have used more school spirit. I mean, it might have been different if Jeremy Lin were my contemporary, 
and I could have had a team to root for, but I digress. Back to my mindset at commencement. I did not think the HAA had much more to offer than reunions. I can't tell you how wrong I've been. As I began to establish roots in the Netherlands, I felt adrift. So I reached out to the Harvard Club of the Netherlands and found a home. When I moved to the UK a few years later, I did the same thing with the Harvard Club of the UK, where I was not only welcomed over afternoon tea with alumni, but I also started interviewing for students for the college. When I moved back to New York and started my journey as an entrepreneur, I celebrated and commiserated on the ups and downs of being a founder with so many folks while starting the New York chapter for Harvard alumni entrepreneurs, one of about 60 shared interest groups you can join. I've had many roles at the HAA since, and it's the most rewarding volunteer work I do. It keeps giving so much more than the time I put in. Over the last months, as videos of elderly Asians being attacked surfaced, followed by the Atlanta shootings of Asian women, I shared on social media some of the painful personal experiences I had growing up Chinese American, including how my mother was jumped by a group of youth a few years ago and slammed against the concrete, leaving her with a swollen eye and multiple facial contusions. The next thing I knew, I got emails from the Harvard clubs of Ireland and Boston asking if they could host an allyship event to show support for the AAPI community. We ended up with a Zoom supported by over 65 Harvard clubs, showing alumni how to take action as allies. It's empowering to think not only of the love, but the change and impact this alumni community can bring. Just imagine what else we can do if we come together more often. We can only be one Harvard if we are inclusive and take action for one another. And that is my theme for next year as incoming president of the HAA. As you think about your purpose in this day and age of increasing polarization, I ask you to tap into this resource of 400,000 alumni behind you. This is the legacy John Quincy Adams had in mind when he formed the HAA and became its first president. Welcome to the Harvard Alumni Association, class of 2021. Thank you, Vanessa. My name is Helen Huang, and I'm a resident of Courier House and one of the 2021 gift marshals. I've been keeping journals for as long as I can remember. If you were to skim the entries from freshman year until now, you'd learn about extracurricular adventures, senior thesis research, Zinnikins with my PATH, a classroom to table where we convinced Joe Blitzstein to dress up as Batman for a lecture on Halloween, and Brain Breaks, where late night cereal and tiramisu save the night of peace setting or essay writing. Of course, there were so many other aspects of my college experience that I'm deeply grateful for. But it's moments like these that really encapsulated what it was like to learn and live amongst friends at Harvard. The other gift marshals and I got involved in the senior gift campaign because this year, more than ever, we recognized how important moments like those were to forming our college experiences. We asked ourselves what it means to give during times of collective difficulty and uncertainty, and what role our class could play to support our Harvard community. This year, for the first time, in addition to raising funds, we also asked you to share your wisdom and advice with future Harvard students, understanding that there is strength in memory and strength in continuity. Reflecting back on the past four years, many of us wouldn't be who we are today without the academic programs, financial aid, student life, and community experiences made possible in part by the generosity of alumni and the senior gifts of previous classes. Thank you for participating in our campaign and ensuring that the Harvard experience can keep getting better. As we graduate tomorrow and officially become alumni, I'm hopeful that we'll continue helping future Harvard students share in those same beloved memories we had during college. Class of 2021, thank you so much for your support. Hi all, my name is Jackson Walker and I'm one of the program marshals for the class of 2021. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Olivia Farrar, our Harvard orator. Olivia is originally from Pittsburgh, New York, and studied English while at the college. 
Outside of the classroom, Olivia was a well-decorated member of the Harvard Radcliffe Varsity Lightweight Women's Crew Team, earning both gold and silver medals at the head of the Charles Regatta, and competing multiple times on the United States U23 national team at the World Rowing Championships. Her love of literature spans well beyond the classroom, as she aims to be a writer one day. She believes everyone wants to find a niche, a foothold, which they can use to climb into a sense of meaning. For her, imagination is that foothold, and the leverage that allows her to see past herself and into other lived experiences. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming a fierce competitor, kind friend, and creative mind, Olivia Farrar. According to Edgar Allan Poe, a great story has two elements. Class of 2021, bear with me and forgive any cliches. I want to tell you something an author said about stories. In an essay published in 1842, Poe argues that fiction is composed of two elements, which he calls unity and effect. Together, these characteristics make up the unity of effect, which is the experience endowed by a meaningful bit of writing. In Poe's mind, a story has unity if its whole is greater than the sum of its parts. In other words, it's good if, while reading, you forget that the fiction is composed of discrete words, sentences, and paragraphs. In your mind, it just is. You don't have to think about the veins that run through your skin to make your hand move. Writing should be the same way. The second element, effect, is straightforward. Stories have to transport you. Fiction changes the world it interacts with in the simplest, smallest ways. For a story to have good effect, then, Poe was convinced that it had to be short. To Poe, the reader would be the most spellbound by the effect of a story if they could read it all in one sitting. In his words, if two sittings be required, the affairs of the world interfere, and everything like totality is at once destroyed. That last bit seems especially true. The affairs of the world do have a habit of interfering with good stories, these days in particular. Finally, Poe also said that authors should only start writing once they know the ending. Why is all of this relevant to us, class of 2021? Poe died nearly 200 years ago. By all accounts, he was a strange man who kept to himself and penned in the dark. Most of this class, I'd hazard or hope to say, won't be professionally writing macabre poems about ravens after graduation. At the risk of making a familiar analogy, however, every stage of life is its own story that we, consciously and subconsciously, narrativize. We are each constantly in the business of constructing fictions around ourselves, building plots that we like to be within and, someday, to look back at. College is, without question, a formative story within each of our lives. On this happy day, the pandemic is the last thing anyone wants to reflect on. Yet, it would be remiss not to acknowledge it. After all, we are not together physically for this graduation. We're spread out, across the country and the world, reduced from hugs and laughter and conversation into bites across all too familiar computer screens. Still, we are experiencing this thing together, not only from our screens, but in the story we have formed by studying as a class these four years, and in each of the small stories we have personally had to create for ourselves to make sense of the last year. This is Harvard. We all know and constantly feel the pressures and privileges of our education. Graduates from this class will go on to be the next generation of researchers, scientists, politicians, and business leaders. No matter what challenges COVID-19 has brought to our educational journey, everyone collected here will receive the honor of a Bachelor's of Arts from one of the top universities in the world. Know that. Be proud of what you have authored. How would Poe characterize the unity and effect of our Class of 2021 story? From freshman to senior year, we each experience near constant change, academically and personally. When we look back on our four-year journey, we will likely see it in terms of the people we were at specific times. Still, even though college is the work of four distinct years, 32 distinct courses, 128 distinct credit hours, and uncountable distinct rounds of HUD's Red Spice Chicken, all of these distinct elements have to be added for a degree. That is Poe's idea of unity. That is, as Poe would argue, a whole greater than the sum of its parts. However, if you remember, Poe also said that a story with unity should be read in one sitting. If that's true, 
if a good story must be consumed in one immersive, extended bout, one which is uninterrupted by the affairs of the world, then the unity of our collective story, the story that belongs to the class of 2021 alone, has been broken. After all, we have faced an ongoing pandemic with loss of life in the United States greater than World War II. We have faced near economic collapse with millions of Americans losing their jobs and livelihoods. We have faced a mental health crisis likely as disastrous as the virus, tearing apart lives and communities at a level that can't be captured in positive test results. And we have faced another crisis in the United States, one of social and racial injustice, which equally pulls at the warp and weft of our population. This is to say nothing of the struggles of international students and of the innumerable challenges that the year has brought across the globe. We are graduating at a time when there is nearly no way to prevent the affairs of the world from encroaching on our ability to feel and derive meaning from our stories. And given that this is a class full of future leaders, we bear this burden doubly. We have a sense of obligation towards these affairs and to concerning ourselves with the tremendous strife of the outside world. For many of us, the romanticism of losing ourselves within the unity of effect in a good story has long been stripped away. After all, when you finish a story, in one sitting or in many, the book closes and you have to wake up to the rest of the world, a world that you want to change. But class of 2021, I'm going to disagree with Poe. A story doesn't have to be read in one sitting to be good. Fiction is powerful escapism, but writing is meaningless if you can't compare it to your own lived experiences. It's okay if the affairs of the world, even affairs as challenging as those of the last year, weave themselves into the reading experience. Stories are little test chambers, experiments in reality, which allow us to trial predictions for our real lives and troubles. College is like this too. I believe that the two consciousnesses, the reading one and the living one, should always go hand in hand. When we look back on these four years, I sincerely hope that we recognize the power that comes with the broken unity of many great stories and the lessons that our disrupted senior year taught us. Lessons as valuable as those we learned in Seaver, the Science Center, or Emerson. I hope, no, I know, that the changed effect of the story that comes with our diplomas will have a more profound impact. This book is ending. I said earlier that many of us find it silly to read fiction instead of doing work. We want to make a difference in the affairs of the world, not shy away from them. However, Class of 2021, please know, your story, our story, the story of the rest of life will require times of being lost in a different reality and times of being painfully aware of the buzzing, drunkenly anticipatory energy of the present. Poe was an exceptional author, but he was wrong. There's no two-step formula to storytelling, just like there's no clear-cut path through Harvard. But fellow members of the class of 2021, in the face of every challenge, we've done it. Finally, I don't think a good author has to know the ending before they start writing. None of us could have predicted the pandemic, but I think very few of us could have predicted the people we would be today, pandemic or no pandemic. That's how true writing and living goes. It's setting forward, stepping out of your door or into an unknown cadence of words and sentences and hoping that your feet and your fingers find the way. And if the degree we are each being awarded shows anything, it's this, we did find our way. Congratulations, graduates. Hello. My name is Yuri Grace Ohashi, and I am one of the program marshals for the class of 2021. As we celebrate this remarkable journey, let us also celebrate those we have lost along the way. I reckon most of us have lost someone we hold dear in these four or so years, or know someone who has, and the salience of these losses especially resonates with our class in the wake of the events that have befallen us in the past year. We stand with hopefulness for the future, but do not forget those who are no longer by our side. Let us take this moment to remember and honor them.
One person particularly close to heart for many of us is one of our class's own, and certainly one of our class's best, who passed away this time two years ago, Sandeep Nurmel. Sandeep's exceptional brilliance, talent, and charisma have and will continue to resonate throughout the Harvard community and beyond. He will always hold a special place in our hearts and in the class of 2021. Hello, I'm Swathi Srinivasan, one of the program marshals for the class of 2021. Today, it is our distinct honor to introduce the recipients of the Richard Glover and Henry Russell Ames Memorial Award. The class of 2021 comprises countless individuals who have dedicated themselves to serving and changing the lives of others at Harvard and beyond. But the great paradox of service is that these individuals and their inspiring efforts often go unacknowledged by our broader communities. As such, the purpose and spirit of the Ames Award is to finally shine a light on these leaders, to honor two unsung heroes in the class of 2021. I'm Christopher Altizer, also a program marshal for the class of 2021. On June 19th, 1935, Richard Glover Ames and Henry Russell Ames, brothers and Harvard students, gave their lives to save their father, who was washed overboard during a storm off the coast of Newfoundland. Every year since, the Ames Award has been given in their memory to recognize two members of our class who have shown energy in helping others and who exhibit the same heroic character and inspiring leadership as the Ames Brothers. The selection committee receives a large number of nominations from faculty, faculty deans, tutors, coaches, and fellow students. I now have the incredible privilege and honor of introducing the first recipient of this year's Ames Award. When I first read the nomination for this Ames honoree, it took only the first paragraph for my jaw to drop. I learned that she immigrated from Vietnam when she was 13 years old, overcame language barriers, and then soon helped tutor other students to do the same. 
This was all while she was busy becoming valedictorian of her high school and the first in her family to attend college. Now imagine my complete astonishment when I realized that I hadn't even made it to her college achievements. While a student at the college, this honoree served as president of the Kidney Disease Screening and Awareness Program, where she worked to provide free chronic kidney disease screenings to marginalized communities across the greater Boston area. She was also deeply committed to her hometown of Baltimore, where she tackled disparities in HIV screening and access and treatment, while simultaneously serving as a Health Pals peer advisor in her home away from home, Quincy House, and as a student teacher in her home country through the Harvard and Vietnam program. This amazing individual's commitments extend far beyond her own communities to also include rehabilitative patients at Spalding Hospital and housing insecure individuals in Cambridge as co-president of Harvard Road to Recovery and a volunteer at Harvard Square Homeless Shelter, respectively. Her numerous awe-inspiring leadership positions speak to her commitment to alleviate health disparities, and her selflessness shines through a college career devoted to bridging care gaps through attentive empathy and maturity. This Ames honoree is caring, collaborative, talented and insightful, all words that her nominees and mentors use to describe her. She's managed to balance being pre-med, a feat of its own, with a remarkable commitment to advocating for the underserved in every space she's found herself. It is her heart and soul, her passion and humility, and her relentless aspiration to improve the world at every step that merit this award and likely many others to come. Please join me in congratulating our first Ames Award recipient, Nu Dang. Congratulations! Oh my god! Oh my god! This is so cute! And we're thrilled to be honoring you with the Richard Glover Ames and Henry Russell Ames Award. Oh my god, I'm so glad! Thank you so much! This is so surprising, but I want to thank all of my friends and mentors and advisors and professors at Harvard. Um, because I am originally from an underserved high school. I'm a Vietnamese immigrant um, who came here just a few years ago. And so for me, going to Harvard was like a big transition. And I honestly didn't even know if I could handle Harvard. Um, but the reason that I was able to grow so much was because of the community I found. And these, what you call like heroic acts were actually um, activities that helped me grow as well, like working at the homeless shelter and uh, providing free kidney disease screenings to underserved and non-English speaking communities in Massachusetts. Um, so all of those things, like I'm very thankful for the people that I work with who inspire me to become better every day. Um, so I'm very honored to receive this award, but I also want to share it with everyone at Harvard and outside of Harvard who has helped me along the way. It is with distinct honor and excitement that I introduce the second recipient of this year's Ames Award. Bravery, courage, advocacy, there may be multiple interpretations of the word heroism, but our second Ames honoree certainly fits most, if not all of these definitions. He served on three combat deployments as a team leader and as a squad leader in his battalion's mortar platoon. He was directly responsible for the well-being of soldiers serving under him and was the most well-respected squad leader in the platoon. However, his incredible selflessness did not stop upon matriculating to Harvard. As a co-founder of the Harvard Undergraduate Veterans Organization, this honoree advocated for veterans on campus, off campus, and those who are considering an application to Harvard. He not only created a strong support network for undergraduates who have served in our nation's armed forces, but he has also assisted prospective veteran students in the application and matriculation process. Last, but certainly not least, he has been critical as an active member of the Dudley community where he has been the main proponent of the university providing MBTA student discounts to off-campus students in order to commute to campus. When I met this honoree in late April on a Zoom call alongside his nominators, it was clear from the moment I entered the call that he is deeply cherished by many at Dudley and that his care knows no bounds. It was truly a gift to be able to sit amongst this honoree's peers and administrators and to know that his impact will carry on for veteran and off-campus students long after he has exited Johnston Gate. Craig Rogers, the program manager for military services at Harvard, shares his adoration for our second honoree, saying, quote, he has demonstrated unwavering devotion in his pursuit of an improved undergraduate experience for military veteran students at Harvard College. His collegiality, professionalism, and energy make him extraordinarily effective in all that he does. Please join me in a much-deserved congratulations for our second Ames Award recipient, Thomas Bassett. 
Congratulations. Congratulations. Thomas. You are the winner of the Ames Award. Uh, and we are so happy to have you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored. I'm really honored. One, thank you to everybody who has helped me out through the last uh, four years at college, primarily with um, everything around around veterans. You know, like I wrote about it in, in my um, in my talk at the, at the Memorial Church, but essentially, you know, I came to Harvard, one of a, a, a very small minority at Harvard. So a veteran came in with one other veteran in my class, four total at Harvard, um, and, and kind of struggled my first year to, to get acclimated to campus and everything. And then just through the help of the administration, including specifically people like um, you know, uh, Dean Laura and everybody and, and Carvina, I mean, so incredibly helpful for me to feel welcome, for uh, others to feel welcome, and others to feel like Harvard is, is their place, a place for veterans. And so it's been hugely helpful. Um, you know, could not have made it throughout the last four years without you all. And I know that Harvard is a much better place for, for all the work you've done uh, um, to help veterans get in and to help veterans acclimate to the, to the university. And I think Harvard is a much better place for it. So thank you so much to everybody um, and, and really, uh, really appreciate it. My name is Matt Thomas, and I'm a program marshal for the class of 2021. Next, Marie Konopaki will deliver the Ivy oration as she reflects on our journey with levity and humor. The pride of Quincy House in Diamond Head, Mississippi, Marie is a woman of many interests and talents. In the span of a year, she switched concentrations from government to computer science to art, film, and visual studies. For her roommates, she's now a coding queen and fashion maven who once locked eyes with J. Cole. Having been in the Lampoon and Advocate, on campus she's famous for her art, her wit, and her robot dance, all three of which are equally unparalleled. Known to crochet her own tops and have been an early investor in GameStop, she's both an old soul and ahead of her time. As a first generation student, she is determined to combine her computer science and artistic skills to focus on accessibility and diversity in all that she creates. With that, I could not be more excited to introduce our Ivy orator, Marie Konopaki. We remember March 10th, 2020, the day Harvard told us they were sending us home like it was yesterday. Well, Actually, some of us only remember that morning. The afternoon, on the other hand, was such a blur. I can only guess what I was doing, but knowing me, I was probably doing my homework or something. I did have a pounding headache later that night, which must have been from studying so hard. I actually recently saw some pictures from that day of crowded courtyards and tons of people on the street. It must have been the world's biggest study break. It really warmed my heart. Let me tell you, parents and faculty, during that last week on campus, we all really focused on our education. Harvard was actually one of the first colleges in the country to send its students home, but how did they know so early on? Clearly, Harvard has access to critical, secret information that allows it to make insanely accurate predictions. Thus, Harvard administration, I have one question I'd like the answer to. Am I too late to invest in Dogecoin? Even though we've been at Harvard for four years, I'm only just now realizing the extent of its mysteriousness. A friend from home recently asked me what our college's mascot is, and I could not give an answer. While I know that we're the Harvard Crimson, that's an abstract idea that doesn't physically exist. It's like being called the Harvard Dreams or the Harvard Multicultural Center. It makes sense we overlooked our missing mascot since none of us go to sports games. But it's not like we're unathletic. Look around you. There have never been so many high school cross country team captains on one campus. It makes me wonder, amongst all of the high schoolers in the world, how did Harvard select which ones were the most deserving of one day experiencing Mather Lather? I mean, it seems their admissions process is almost flawless, give or take a few rescinded prefrosh. But besides them, Harvard had faith and saw potential in us that maybe we didn't see at the time. Like their investment in fossil fuels, it shows that Harvard truly believes in things, even if we don't. But sometimes, Harvard surprises us by doing something we really needed. I, for one, love that they got rid of Harvard time since it gives me an ample 15 minutes to walk from one Zoom meeting to another. 
There are also a few other questions I have about Harvard that remain unanswered. What type of fish is Red's best catch? What does praxis mean? And who was going to be the Yardfest artist last year? Unfortunately, we'll never know. Even if they told us the name of the Yardfest artist, we still wouldn't know who they are. As it's our time to graduate, it still feels like we're not ready to move on. There are so many experiences and traditions we missed. I still haven't done, you know what, on the John Harvard statue or peed in the Widener stacks. And Primal Scream. The people who are most sad about this esteemed tradition being canceled last year are not the students, but rather the strange middle-aged locals who lurk with camcorders. If you receive a suspicious email inviting you to virtual primal scream, do not click on the link. Instead, wait for the class committee's email with a link to the official virtual primal scream. It's scary to think that only six months from now, our Harvard email addresses will become inactive. We will lose the things we always thought were constant. One, our Spotify student discounts, and two, our place on the Harvard Dems email list. The passage of time is like the quad shuttle. It slips past you, and as soon as you realize you've missed it, it's too late. For those of you that live on the river, the quad shuttle is like your path. It's there, but you don't use it. As we leave college, some people might tell us, welcome to the real world. Let's be honest though, we've been in the real world for over a year now, ever since I had to purchase silverware for the first time in my life. When the pandemic started, many of us had to live on our own, even if we weren't ready yet. Nothing Harvard teaches could have prepared us for dealing with something even worse than freshman proctors. Landlords. Could you imagine if you informed your resident dean that your dorm has a rat in it and they said, deal with it? At least in Adam's house, the dean would have kindly informed you that that is your little roommate. And he's a double legacy. I also learned what the value of a dollar was, which turns out to be about five ramen packets, a scratch-off ticket, or a Whopper on Wednesdays. I also had to learn the value of $800, which for my roommates and I was a single electricity bill. When Harvard told us this year would be remote, I initially thought, what a sad way to end our college experience. But on the bright side, I haven't heard the Lowell Bell Ringers in over a year, and I probably never will again. In a way, it evens out. Big kudos to the groups that seamlessly made the virtual transition. For instance, a cappella groups found new and ingenious ways of performing remotely, and I found new and ingenious ways of ignoring them. Despite all of its flaws, I will miss some parts of this odd digital education we got. My typing speed has never been faster and my eyesight has never been worse. Breakout rooms put me face to face with incredible people I never would have met. Did we exchange any words? No. To the single student who consistently kept their camera on in a 400 person weekly Zoom lecture, your bravery does not go unnoticed. However, the other 399 of us stayed incredibly well rested. That being said, class of 2021, thank you for the memories and we'll make even more on our senior trip next week. See you all in Cabo. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Freed. I'm a program marshal for the class of 2021 and I'm deeply honored and grateful to have the privilege of introducing our featured speaker, Jeremy Lin. Jeremy is a graduate of the Harvard class of 2010. While he was here, Jeremy lived in Leverett House and of course, garnered national attention as a record shattering point guard and senior captain for the Harvard men's basketball team. In the 11 years since his own Harvard graduation, Jeremy has found success on and off the court. Just two years out of college, Jeremy Lin led the New York Knicks on a winning run, catching the whole nation up in Lin's sanity and leading to his own meteoric rise to fame. That same year, Jeremy was named a Times list of 100 most influential people, and he hasn't slowed down since. Following his time with the Knicks, Jeremy played for a number of teams across the NBA, became the first ever Asian American to win an NBA championship with the Toronto Raptors in 2019, and went on to compete in China. Today, 
Jeremy is back in his home state of California playing for the Santa Cruz Warriors. He has been an unstoppable advocate for Asian American representation in sports and a reminder to athletes everywhere that persistence pays off. In 2013, he launched the Jeremy Lin Foundation, which works to help lift children from poverty. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, Jeremy has provided crucial relief for communities across the country and worked for racial justice. In 2020, the Jeremy Lin Foundation's Be The Light campaign donated over $1.2 million to COVID relief efforts and worked to raise awareness of the rise in anti-Asian harassment and racism. In the wake of horrific loss and violence, Jeremy has authored pieces for Time Magazine and the Players' Tribune on the importance of standing up for the most vulnerable among us. Just this last year, the Asian Pacific Fund named Jeremy the recipient of their Leadership and Philanthropy Award for his continued advocacy and tireless work for justice. Jeremy is an incredible leader whose life and work can remind every one of us of our obligation to protect one another and work to ensure that each of us not only survives, but thrives. It's our great honor to have him address our class today. Please join me in welcoming our 2021 Class Day speaker, Jeremy Lin. Thank you, Rachel, for the kind introduction. Thank you to the 2021 Class Committee for inviting me here. All right, relax, relax. Harvard class of 2021. Wow, I'm so honored to be here. To be honest, this whole thing almost didn't happen. Let me bring you along the journey of how I even got to this point of giving this speech. When I was first asked to speak at class day in true student athlete fashion, I tried to turn down this extra writing assignment. I reminded the student committee that while the rest of you turned in brilliant personal statements to get into Harvard, I turned in a video of sweet moves from my California State Championship game. I even tried to show the class committee a writing sample from my freshman year Expos class. I wrote about the movie Lost in Translation starring Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. I got a C minus in the class and I still have no idea what the movie is about. Take that, model minority myth. But I get it. In a year all about diversity and inclusion, you needed a token. So here I am, your token Asian athlete. athlete. The first class day speaker to dunk a basketball since Mother Teresa. I want to be transparent. Because I have zero skill in public speaking, and it's already tough enough to deliver a remote speech where I talk into a camera lens with no audience, I brought my own hype team. Basically, whenever I tell a joke, my family has to laugh really, really hard. <laughs> All right, we'll work on the timing. Off the bat, I want to acknowledge that it's been a tough, tough 15 months for the entire world. Because of the pandemic, the class of 2021 was cut off from the full college experience. You were far from campus, you didn't get to see your friends, basically you all got quadded. Through no fault of your own, your senior year was not the victory lap you envisioned. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? Okay, just, just go inside. Seriously, this virtual commencement is not the finish line celebration you deserved. It doesn't lessen the accomplishment it actually increases it. It's like a supply and demand thing. Ask anyone who took Ec 10. Shout out Professor Mankiw. And in a way, honestly, I can relate. I missed my commencement too. In spring 2010, I was invited to a pre-draft workout with the Los Angeles Lakers, basically a job interview, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I slipped out of Cambridge. My friends attended various graduation events carrying a cardboard cutout of me. Here's proof. You've heard of Flat Stanley, this was Flat Jeremy. The sad thing about missing my own graduation is that I was so focused on looking forward, I didn't get a chance to be present. Even as one chapter in my life was ending, I was already chasing down my next goal. This is a common theme in my life. As many of you can probably relate to, I have endless ambition and I'm always focused on my next goal, with everything. In high school, I was so intent on eating my worth at an all-you-can-eat sushi restaurant that I downed 100 pieces of sushi and ate lobster tails in 30 minutes, only to throw up everything I ate in the middle of the restaurant. I did get the full refund though. So yeah, you can add that to my Wikipedia list of accomplishments. I often say that the one thing I regret most about Linsanity is that I didn't slow down and appreciate the moment I was in while I was in it. I had finally accomplished my dreams of becoming a starting NBA basketball player, and all I could think about was the next game. 
That's because success isn't some magical destination. You won't find contentment once you get there. During Linsanity, I was literally the most popular person on the planet. I was on the cover of Time, Sports Illustrated, almost every publication you could think of. But three weeks into Linsanity, before a game against the Chicago Bulls, I couldn't even eat or sleep. I had so much anxiety, I was stuck in bed shaking. And that's when I learned, if you can't be content in a journey, you will not be content at your destination. There will always be a new goal. When you're in the middle of making it, you often can't even recognize that you're there. There's constantly something else to do, something else to fix, something else to maintain. So today, take a deep breath and soak it in. Really soak it in. Remember the grind, your toughest classes, your toughest tests, your biggest accomplishments, the all-nighters in the library. Soak in this moment and everything you've done to get here. Think of everyone that got you here and all the people that have supported you along the way. Allow yourself to rest for a minute and be grateful for that. Maybe your college experience didn't go the way you wanted it to. Maybe you feel sad for what your senior year could have been. Let yourself experience that for a moment, but then let yourself experience joy. You've made it here and that's something to be celebrated. Since I left Harvard in 2010, my career's had a lot of ups and downs. More than most fields, sports can be quantitative. The numbers in basketball include scoring, assists, shooting percentages. The figures can become the focus. It's easy to get reduced to a line of statistics and a box score. The what you accomplish and how you do it becomes greater than who you are and why you do what you do. For me, figuring out who I was and why I did what I did was a journey that came down to my identity and my faith. My parents emigrated from Taipei in the 70s. They uprooted themselves from everything they knew to pursue opportunity in the United States. Growing up in the Bay Area, it never felt like being Asian American was abnormal. It was just a part of who I was. Sure, I would get told I had smelly lunches at school when I brought dumplings to class, but I was happy to shrug that off because, well, I like to eat and dumplings are delicious. Once I started to become known at the public level, I started to get attention for being the Asian basketball player. Asian American organizations wanted me to be their spokesperson. Every media interview I was asked about my racial identity. Every NBA game in a new city was suddenly Asian Heritage Night. There was one road trip where I had three Asian Heritage Nights in one week. I love my heritage and all, but it was a lot of photos to take like this. I couldn't understand why every Asian person looked at me like all their hopes and dreams were on my shoulders. While every white person looked at me like, wow, Yao Ming is way shorter than I thought. I just wanted to figure out how to win the next game. It was a lot to carry and I ran away from it. I wanted to fit in and just be known as a good basketball player, full stop. Now I've come to understand that my identity is part of my superpower. What makes me different is not a weakness, but potentially my greatest strength. Even though I will always be more than an Asian American basketball player, just as each of you are more than your backgrounds, who I am and where I come from is woven into everything that I do. That's the cold hard veritas. My parents' immigrant experience teaches me about sacrifice and about taking risks to pursue your dreams. My family background teaches me loyalty and deep respect and love for my elders. Being someone who is underrepresented in my field allows me to empathize deeply with the underdogs and the overlooked. My culture adds depth to everything I do and allows me to connect with fans on a deeper level. It's something I'm so excited to embrace more and more every day. And what's not to embrace anyways? When you really think about it, these poses are a great idea. While I learned to embrace who I was, I was also on a journey to figure out why I did what I did. When I was younger, competition fueled everything I did. Anytime someone doubted or disrespected me, I was fueled by wanting to dominate them the next time we played. I was always trying to stick it to someone, the coach who didn't recruit me, the fan base that called me racial slurs, the opposing point guard who underestimated me. I can tell you honestly that that fuel will work for a while, but it won't lead you to happiness. Eventually, there will be someone you won't be able to prove wrong and somewhere you won't be able to succeed. For me, that was getting a season-ending injury at the height of my career. After struggling with team situations that weren't the best fit for me, 
coaches that didn't want to use me and being told over and over again that I would never live up to the expectations of Linsanity, I finally got my dream job with the Brooklyn Nets. I was playing with a coach that trusted me in a team that was playing my style of basketball in a starting position I knew I could carry. I was ready to prove everyone wrong. Then, in my first game at the start of my second season with the Nets, I got a devastating injury that ended my career with them as quickly as it had started. It was the lowest moment of my basketball career. The pain on my face from realizing the extent of my injury was broadcast on national television. But as I started to accept the injury and move into rehab, I found that I was surprisingly joyful. I had figured out that my purpose, or my why as a basketball player, was not just to succeed on the court, but to lean into my faith and use my role to inspire others. I was loved by God no matter what. I've played professional basketball for 10 years. I've broken barriers, I've made history. But one thing that bothers me the most is seeing Asian American kids growing up today facing the same doubts, racism, stigmas that I did growing up. Rewriting these stereotypes is something I will spend the rest of my life trying to change. In this year where we've seen the pandemic expose so many social justice issues and racial inequalities in our society, I hope that you will take your identity and whatever background and life experiences you have to help change the lives of those around you too. Because after being at the top of the world during Linsanity, I can tell you that success without community is absolutely meaningless. Getting somewhere without being able to bring other people up with you isn't worth it. When I look back on my life, the Linsanity moments will be fun. Winning an NBA championship will be unforgettable. But the most fulfilling thing to me will be whether I inspired people and changed things for the next generation. Did what I say to the media, how I used the money I earned, where I invested my time, help change things for anyone who is currently oppressed, marginalized, or underrepresented. Will someone after me have less barriers chasing their dreams because of what I did on and off the court? After graduation, people are going to bombard you with questions like, what are you gonna do? What will you accomplish? What exactly is a concentration? But the better questions to ask yourself are, who are you going to be? Why do you do what you do? And who are you going to bring up with you along the way? You will always be more than your accomplishments. No one experiences success forever. This year, I put my all into getting back into the NBA and ultimately came up short. Despite the many years of professional basketball I've played, some people will only know me for the month of insanity. And that's okay, because I know who I am outside of basketball and I know why I'm here. Many of you will go on to be barrier breakers, and I hope you embrace that. It's a lonely road to walk, but don't feel like you have to do it alone. Lean on the people that love you and learn from different people's experiences. Patch together the mentors you need from different industries, different authors, different influences. Never let yourself be the smartest one in the room. But more than anything, I hope you bring others up with you. For every challenge you face, I hope you make it so that the person after you can have an easier road. That's your homework for the rest of your life and the work of today is celebration. So party it up, do something special. Don't let the moment pass unacknowledged. Proudly say, I graduated from Harvard, instead of mumbling, I went to school in Boston. I want to send a special, special congratulations to anyone who is the first in their family to graduate from college. That's an awesome achievement. And it's a little mean that you set the bar for future family members at Harvard. I also want to send a special shout out to all the graduating athletes. You know I had to represent. A lot of our classmates shrugged at our efforts, but we played for each other and we graduated. And finally, I want to say that having a degree from Harvard has done absolutely nothing for me. Seriously, it hasn't helped me at all in my chosen profession. If anything, it was just a quick, easy way to spend $200,000 and feel superior to Cornell grads. Still, I'm really glad I have it. And I'm really proud to be a part of this community. A community that when it was announced that I'd be giving the class day speech, flooded me with text from unknown numbers. Famous speech writers, comedians, everyone reaching out to help. Did someone leak my Xbox essay or something? For real, I'm so, so proud to be a part of the Harvard family. We've spawned scores of comedy writers, 
eight presidents, a ton of Nobel Prize winners, and only one class day speaker who had the courage to wear shorts. I can't help it, I just keep breaking barriers. Take that glass ceiling. Thanks for having me. Go Crimson. Peace. You want me, the washed up manager of the men's tennis team, to speak after the most prominent Asian American athlete of our generation? Great. Thank you, Jeremy, for your remarks. My name is Prashanth Kumar, or PK, and I'm a proud member of Mather House. It's an incredible honor to serve as the second marshal for the class of 2021. Now, this speech was supposed to be a brief reflection on our last four years here, but I'm not really sure how to do that. Even before we got on campus, we were different. We were named the most diverse class in the 380 years of Harvard's history, a remarkable title. Then, 10 kids got rescinded and we were labeled the meme class, a slightly different headline on the news. Now we're here, four years later, and we're graduating into an uncertain world after almost 15 months of virtual school. On the way, we spent opening days partying on the fourth floor of Gray's, were the first class to have sanctions, got a new president, somehow made it through the Varsity Blues unscathed, built the Smith Center, lost Harvard time, had sanctions overturned, and got kicked off campus before senior week. I could keep writing down headlines that I found on the Crimson, but I'm not sure if they're still canceled. With the pandemic, we've lost the normality of our college experience. Some of our class took time off, others did classes while living with family, some got married, and others worked at the Cleveland Browns. The breadth of everyone's unique experiences is exactly why I don't know what to say here. It's impossible. The thing is, as we look forward to our in-person celebrations in the future, I'm still not going to know what to say. Some are going to be analysts at Goldman, others are going to be teaching at local high schools, some will be single, and others found love with the real Match 21. But one thing's for certain, we graduated in the midst of a transformative historical event, and as cheesy and platitudy as this sounds, it's something to be incredibly proud of. Friends, family, and faculty, I thank you again for joining us in celebrating this moment. Class of 2021, congratulations, we did it. And I'll see you back in person soon. To conclude our program, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our Class Day Otis. Number five, my roommate and my metaphorical son, Mario Haskett Jr. That's all we got If situations differ No doubt you would deliver Your energies Contagious Thankful for that jubilee So gracious So gracious History coursing through the campus vines For all thy blessings We must give thanks For all thy blessings We must give thanks I come from a city where the sun ain't always shining I come from a city where the stars ain't always bright You show me a love that I could never leave behind You show me in this world you could be anything you like You show me that you can go be anything you like Those who came before us taught us to never settle Memories forever set in stone like heavy metal Storms come and go like the bows of a cello And still we rise to the top like the hills of Monticello Flowers blooming crimson covered meadows Water from the trials, won't you carry me into the harbor I'ma run up off the stage screaming fair harbor, fair harbor